Have you ever wondered what colored eggs have to do with Christ's death? And what Easter rabbits and hot cross buns have to do with Christ's resurrection? And what about the name Easter itself? Do you know its origin and meaning? And what about Easter sunrise services? On Easter morning, millions gather together to watch the rising of the sun. Why? What does it mean? Just how did the Christian world come to accept and celebrate Easter? And where did these customs come from? Easter, what does the name mean? How is it associated with Jesus Christ? Colored eggs? The Easter bunny? Easter egg hunts? Hot cross buns? Easter sunrise services? Why does Easter fall on a different date every year? A Friday crucifixion and a Sunday resurrection? Jesus said that the sign that he was Messiah would be that he would stay in the grave for three days and three nights. How can we count three days and three nights from sundown Friday to Sunday morning? Since Easter today is observed as a resurrection festival of Jesus Christ, you might find it amazing that Easter is sometimes observed before Passover, which is the actual day of Jesus' death. Obviously, you can't have a resurrection without a death first. Perhaps you will find it hard to believe, but the observance of Easter is never once commanded in the Bible. There is no indication of the observance of the Easter festival in the New Testament, Encyclopedia Britannica. The celebration of Easter does not appear in the New Testament, Dictionary of Religion and Ethics. Some of you might say, now wait a minute, I remember seeing Easter in my King James Bible. Well, it is true that the King James translators placed the word Easter in Acts 12, verse 4, but the Greek word in the manuscript is Pasha, which means Passover. Pasha appears 29 times in the New Testament, and 28 of those times the King James translators rendered it correctly as Passover. The term Pasha means Passover, can be used to include the entire spring festival of the Days of Unleavened Bread. And this is a case in Acts chapter 12. Most Bible scholars agree that the word Easter in the King James is a mistranslation and should be rendered Passover, as it is in most all other Bible versions. Perhaps there has never been a more absurd translation than in this text in Acts 12, verse 4. Adam Clark Commentary Isn't it amazing that Easter is celebrated by a billion Christians worldwide? yet is never once mentioned in the Bible. In fact, that is shocking, but it is true. Instead, Jesus commanded his followers to keep the Passover in remembrance of him. And when he had taken some bread, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20. If the name Easter didn't come from the Bible, just where did it come from? And what does it mean? The modern term Easter developed from the Old English word Easter or Aoster. Aoster was the name of a goddess in Anglo-Saxon paganism. The name itself ultimately derives from east, meaning the direction of east, the rising of the sun. She's called the dawn servant, or one who illuminates, and is closely associated with the pagan goddesses Venus, the dawn star, and Ishtar, the Babylonian mother of heaven, as well as many ancient fertility goddesses. The Egyptian goddess Isis the Phrygian goddess Sibyl, the Zidonian goddess Astarte, 
the Greek goddess Artemis, the Germanic goddess Suna, and the mother of them all, Semiramis of Babylon. The concept of the goddess Easter can be traced all the way back to wicked Semiramis, wife of Nimrod, the sworn enemy of God. The original mother so widely worshipped is believed to be Semiramis, who it is well known was worshipped by the Babylonians and other Eastern nations. The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. As civilizations developed after the Great Flood, the worship of Easter spread throughout the ancient world, where she was venerated in almost every segment of society. In the spring, at the vernal equinox, the pagan man sought fertility for himself, his flocks and herds, and his land. He believed that the goddess he worshipped was fertilized by the god he worshipped during this season in order that she could fertilize the world. Since his life and the lives of his family were dependent upon a bountiful crop and animals which flourished, he sought to ensure success by worshiping this goddess of the spring. Of course, this custom was practiced long before the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus, which means its roots predated Christianity. The early Christian church never celebrated Easter, but instead obeyed Jesus' commandment to keep the Passover. Easter was not attached to Jesus or his resurrection until hundreds of years later by the Roman Catholic Church. Every Easter, millions of Christians gather to watch the rising of the sun. This ancient custom probably originated among the Germanic peoples who worshipped Suna, their goddess of the spring. The populace would kneel and beseech Suna, their goddess of the dawn, imploring her to bring back the long-awaited spring days. Suna was the German equivalent of the other ancient sun fertility goddesses such as Eostor and Sibyl. After offering sacrifices to the goddess on Saturday evening, they retired until Sunday morning when they would gather together to face the east and watch the sunrise. Did you know that even the ancient Israelites began to practice this pagan religious custom? And behold, at the entrance to the temple of the Lord, about 25 men with their backs to the temple and their faces toward the east, prostrating themselves eastward toward the sun. He said to me, Do you see this? Is it too light a thing for the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they have committed here? Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. The ancient Persians, when they kept the festival of the solar new year, presented each other with colored eggs. Chambers Encyclopedia. From Egypt, these sacred eggs can be distinctly traced to the banks of the Euphrates. The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. Do you not see what they are doing in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the Queen of Heaven, and they pour out drink offerings to other gods in order to spite me. Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 17 and 18. If you were to ask the typical Christian what Easter is about, they would say the resurrection of Christ. I'm Dave Brown with Crusade TV. What's your name? Uh, Eric Hawkins. Eric, do you celebrate Easter? Uh, yes, I do. What does Easter mean to you? Um, Easter is like the celebration of when Christ, you know, when he ever, uh, he had died on the cross, he was resurrected, and we celebrate the new birth, and all that, all that good stuff. Do you guys do like an Easter egg hunt and stuff like that? Uh, occasionally, you know, for like younger kids and whatnot. If you had to explain to somebody it was like from a different culture, how that came into Christian observance, what would you say? Um, I guess I'd say like the, I guess the Easter eggs, these signify, uh, I guess life being born or reborn. 
What about the Easter Bunny? Not, not a clue. All right, thank you very much. No Thanks. Can I ask you a couple of questions? Sure. I know it doesn't feel like Easter out there tonight, but it's right around the corner. Would you tell me what Easter means to you? Mm, a day full of hiding eggs for little kids to go find and possibly meet up with the family. Right. Now, can you tell, like, if somebody's from a different culture and they've never seen Easter observed, could you tell them what eggs and bunnies have to do with, uh, with say, Jesus and his resurrection? No, I couldn't. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, bud. Hey, what's your name? John Lindsay. Okay, John, if, uh, if you had to explain to somebody from a different culture why Christians observe Easter, what would you say? i uh, say we, just, uh, we observe Easter because of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. And sorry, I'm out of breath. It's all right, I know. Um, Jesus Christ died on, for our sins and stayed on the cross. He came back three days later. And I mean, for, for a person like me, all the sins that I've done, all the sins that you've done, that everybody here has done, even the best person on earth has done sins. And Jesus Christ never did a sin, but yet he still died on the cross for us came back three days later and and that's what Easter means to me. Can you tell me how did it come into the Christian observance the Easter bunny or the Easter eggs? I, I don't I don't know that story. What about uh, say sunrise services? How do we start doing that? I, I don't know that either. I know that I've gone to sunrise service a few times but that's really early in the morning for me being a college student but I don't I don't know those stories but uh, if if you know I would be interested in hearing Okay, very good. Thank you. A few questions while you catch your breath? If I can talk. All right. I know it doesn't feel like Easter outside yet, but it's right around the corner. What does Easter mean to you? Well, Easter means a lot of different things. Uh, Easter means, first of all, that uh, you get to spend time with family. You get to remember that uh, Jesus not only died for us, but he came back. And he's still up there. So that's what it means to me anyways. If you had to explain to somebody that hasn't, uh, not familiar with our culture or the observance, if, if they were to ask, why do Christians have Easter bunnies and Easter eggs, what would you tell them? Well, I mean, there's uh, a lot of symbology in there that'll take a good little while to explain. There'll be probably a little bit more trouble than it's worth with maybe some other cultures like you're talking about. But uh, I mean, the biggest thing about it is just that it's like a new beginning each year. And I mean, it just like, you know, the eggs is the start, is the start of new life and a rabbit is, you know, cute and cuddly and generally pictured as a little tiny bunny, like a new one. And let's say like sunrise services, what would you say to someone that, what does that have to do with Jesus and the resurrection? Well, uh, I mean, it all goes back to kind of the central theme of, you know, new beginnings and new starts, new life, all of that. Because I mean, it's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it's just... I mean, the start of a new day, the start of a new life, you know, even like people that get saved on Easter Sunday. I mean, it's just a great thing, you know, because you have that. It's almost like a celebration every year. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bro. But when you consider the customs used in this religious observance, you can't help but wonder how they fit into the resurrection of Jesus. The dating of Easter is associated with the vernal equinox, not the Passover when Christ was crucified. The name of the festival itself is the name of a pagan fertility goddess. Colored eggs, hot cross buns, and sunrise services all have their origins in pagan sun fertility goddess worship. And perhaps the strangest custom of all is the Easter Bunny. Children's stories in many countries tell how Easter eggs are brought by rabbits. These mammals have represented fertility in many cultures because they breed so quickly. In traditional Christian art, the hair represents lust, and paintings sometimes show a hair at Mary's feet. Reader's Digest, Book of Facts. Isn't it amazing that something that was once viewed as a symbol of lust and its temptation is now commonly associated with the resurrection of Christ. The spring fertility goddess Aoster was always pictured with her sacred rabbit. Here you can see the goddess holding her sacred rabbit 
and on the left, the rabbit holding a basket full of colored eggs. The term Easter Bunny actually means Aoster's Bunny, meaning the sacred rabbit that belongs to the goddess. Each spring, Aoster's rabbit was sent forth with these sacred colored eggs to hide them in the grass and among the trees. Children were sent with baskets to look for and gather these sacred eggs. This was all done to honor the fertility goddess. Now every spring, Christians do the same. Churches hold Easter egg hunts and invite the public to bring their children to participate. But throughout the Bible, we find warnings from God to beware of spiritual deception. In the book of Kings, we find that God condemned the worship of this female goddess. Remember, Easter, Aoster, Ashtoreth, and many others are different names, but the same deity. They have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 33. Let's review what we've learned so far. The observance of Easter is not found in the Bible. The name Easter is the name of a pagan sun fertility goddess. The Babylonians believed the spring goddess hatched from a giant egg which fell from heaven into the Euphrates River. The custom of decorating eggs and Easter egg hunts are pagan customs designed to worship this sex goddess. And the Easter rabbit is not only a sex fertility symbol, but belongs to the goddess herself and helps to carry out the refertilization of the earth each spring. If Easter is a Christian holiday designed to commemorate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, to do it with these customs seems very strange indeed. Neither the apostles nor the gospels have anywhere imposed Easter. Socrates Scholasticus, Ecclesiastical History. The first Christians continued to observe the Jewish festivals, though in a new spirit, of which those festivals had foreshadowed, Encyclopedia Britannica. There is no trace of a yearly festival of a resurrection among the Apostolic Church. Historian Geisler, Roman Catholic Church. So how did all this paganism get into the Christian Church? The answer to this question lies in early history of Christianity, specifically at the Roman Catholic Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, when Constantine the Great, the Emperor of Rome, helped to formulate Christian doctrine. It was there that the observance of Easter was established. The Roman Church had been observing a Sunday Resurrection Festival for some time, but needed help in setting it as a mandate for all churches. With the power of the Roman Emperor himself, the Catholic Church ordered that Christian churches everywhere adopt this observance. Before this council, the churches in Asia Minor, where the Apostle John had resided, did not acknowledge the ecclesiastical authority of the Roman Church. In fact, years earlier, there was considerable debate between these churches and the church at Rome. These churches had continued in observing the biblical Holy Day festivals of Passover, Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacles. Early in the 2nd century AD, the Roman bishop attempted to order all Christian churches to keep a resurrection festival, but those in Asia Minor refused. There was a considerable exchange between Polycarp of Smyrna and Anicetus of Rome, in, in which Polycarp refused to accept the spring resur resurrection festival. Later in the same century, the Roman church under Pope Victor went after Polygrates of Ephesus, demanding that he direct the Asian churches to keep this festival. This is Polygrates' written response as recorded by the historian Eusebius. We observe the genuine day, Passover, neither adding to nor taking from. For in Asia, great lights have fallen asleep, 
which will rise again in the day of the Lord's appearing. Philip, one of the twelve, John, who rested upon the bosom of the Lord, Polycarp of Smyrna. All these observed the fourteenth day of the Passover, according to the gospel, deviating in no respect, but following the rule of faith. I am not threatened or intimidated, for those greater than I have said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Did you notice that the apostles of Christ observed the Passover and said they did so according to the gospel? This clearly means that practicing the gospel includes observing the Passover. They also stated that Passover observance was following the rule of faith. Polygrates understood clearly that the Roman church was not merely adding a resurrection festival to honor Christ, but was replacing the Lord's Passover with it, which is why he said, we ought to obey God rather than men. You see, he is plainly saying to keep the Passover is obeying God, and observing a resurrection festival is obeying men. Polygrates firmly stated, we neither add to nor take away from what God has commanded us. Perhaps he had Deuteronomy chapter 4 in mind. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. Let us remember what Jesus said about forsaking the commandments of God to hold to the traditions of men. He said we could actually find ourselves worshiping him in vain. No Christian wants his worship to be in vain. Notice carefully what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15. And by this you invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as their doctrines the precepts of men. Matthew chapter 15, verses 6 through 9. In spite of solid evidence which shows that the observance of Easter has pagan origins, and the customs and symbols used in its celebration have nothing to do with the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, some will still say, but Jesus was risen on Easter Sunday morning. There are two glaring problems with that argument. Easter is dated from the vernal equinox, not the crucifixion date. And if Jesus was three days and three nights in the grave, he was not resurrected on Sunday morning at all. When asked for a sign to prove that he was the Messiah sent from God, Jesus said this, no sign shall be given to it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew chapter 12, verses 39 and 40. The very truth that Jesus is the promised Messiah hinges on whether he fulfilled that prophecy or not. Muslims use this apparent discrepancy in their attempts to prove that Jesus is not the Messiah. They accept Him as a prophet, but not as the Son of God. They vigorously argue that from Good Friday to Sunday morning calculates to one and a half days in the grave, not three days. Now this is an extremely vital subject because the gospel and Christianity itself breaks down if Jesus is not who He said He was and did not fulfill his own prophecy. The truth is, Jesus was crucified on the Passover. He was the true Passover lamb. For Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Therefore let us celebrate the feast. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Did you notice that Christ is our Passover? Paul was instructing the church to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread? In chapter 11 of this same letter to the Corinthians, he instructs them how to properly observe the Passover. The Corinthians were not Jews, but Gentiles. So it's evident by these scriptures that the early church, both Jews and Gentiles, kept the feasts of God. Now let's not forget what Polycrates wrote to Pope Victor. 
He said they kept the Passover because the apostles did and because it was a vital part of the gospel of Christ and to do so was following the rule of faith. Obviously, the apostles of Christ established a rule of faith which the converts to Christianity were to follow. The Passover, not Easter, was a part of the rule of faith they established. Of course, none of this matters if Jesus was not in the grave for three days and three nights, because it's the only sign that he gave to show that he was the Messiah sent from God. Because the Gospels reveal that Jesus was crucified on the day of preparation, they assume that it was a Friday, which is the preparation day for the weekly Sabbath. But Jesus was crucified on the Passover, which is always a preparation day for the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in which the first day is a high Sabbath or annual Sabbath. John's Gospel account actually mentions that this approaching Sabbath was a high day, meaning first day of unleavened bread. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, for that Sabbath was a high day. John chapter 19, verse 31. The Passover always occurs on the 14th day of the first month on the Hebrew calendar and can fall on any day of the week. The following day, the 15th of Nisan, would be the first day of unleavened bread, a high Sabbath. On the Hebrew calendars, days began and ended sundown. In 31 AD, when Christ was crucified, it fell on Wednesday. At sundown that day would begin the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is why the Jews wanted Jesus dead and off the cross before sundown. Jesus was put on the cross on the Passover, Wednesday, Nisan 14th, at 9 a.m. in the morning. He remained on the cross for six hours until 3 p.m. when they took him down. One of the prominent Jewish leaders asked for his body and placed it in his tomb just prior to sundown, which is the beginning of Unleavened Bread's high Sabbath day. Jesus remained in the tomb three full days and three full nights, fulfilling his own prophecy of himself. From sundown Wednesday to sundown Thursday is one day. From sundown Thursday to sundown Friday is two days. And from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, which is the weekly Sabbath, would be three days. Jesus rose at sundown at the end of the weekly Sabbath. This is why the tomb was already empty when Mary Magdalene came early Sunday morning while it was yet dark. If Jesus had risen on Sunday morning, he would have stayed in the grave for three days and four nights, which would make his prophecy void. Thank God that Jesus' prophecy was fulfilled perfectly and that we now have a Messiah who saves us from our sins. Now let's review what we've learned. The Bible nowhere commands the observance of Easter. In fact, Easter is not even mentioned in the original manuscripts. The apostles taught the church to observe the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread which followed it. Easter observance came into modern Christianity by a mandate issued by the Roman Catholic Church as backed by the Roman state. Many Christians who held to the original practice of keeping the Passover were persecuted for not accepting this new observance. The crucifixion of Jesus was not on Good Friday, but on a Wednesday Passover. From Good Friday to Sunday morning, counts to only one and a half days. Jesus was in the tomb for three full days and three full nights and rose on Saturday at the end of the Sabbath, not Sunday morning. 
The name Easter itself is the name of a pagan sex goddess, and the festival was held in honor of her. The spring fertility goddess was credited with giving life to the world, an honor which only the true God who created all things should receive. The Easter bunny was her pet and was a pagan symbol of fertility. Colored eggs and Easter egg hunts all originated in pagan worship. God condemned the practice of Easter sunrise services and the worship of this pagan sex goddess. These are the facts. Shocking, but true.